episode and uh, Greg. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. So, uh, so this is this is my last lecture. Um, and so here's here's an outline. Oh, by the way, so my student made this animation that's not playing. Uh, and there it is. Um, so I just wanted to. Okay. So that's nice. Um, all right. So this is my last lecture and. Um, you know that I've been trying to really cover this field of spin phonon interactions in solids, and that is in between uh, defect spins and defects, in particular diamond and V centers, and uh, the mechanical motion of um, mechanical systems. And so, you know, first I, I told you about how MV centers work, and then I told you mainly about um, theory and experiments with. Um, spin mechanical couple, coupling uh, that was mediated by a magnetic field gradient. Um, so when you move the cantilever, you shift the Zeeman energy of the, of the spin, and that forms uh, a mechanical spin system. And I talked about the experiments, and then at the end of the last lecture, while you guys were still all sleeping, um, I, I carefully pretended like you were listening, and I told you about how strain interactions can also mediate um, uh, a coherent interaction between um, MV centers in particular, but in, in principle other defects like defects in silicon carbide, and a mechanical resonator that's built out of a single crystal of that material. As long as the, the sort of mechanical resonator is got some kind of an internal strain that can couple to uh, the, the defect, and then of course it has some, some also has some motion. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change gears because um, this is actually now my area um, that we work in in my group, and so I'm going to, instead of trying to cover the field, I'm just going to kind of tell you about what we do a little bit more in detail. Um, now, there's some really beautiful um, experiments that are not in my group, so I will try to, if I don't get like a hook coming in because you won't want to take a picture and eat lunch, um, I will try to also tell you about that, that nice work. Um, and and the, the thing that we do is actually uh, somewhat different. We're actually working in a very different regime than the other groups. So I think it is really nice to mention what people are doing. Um, we're working with, uh, you know, much higher frequency, like gigahertz frequency, bulk mode, diamond resonators. Um, the other groups are working with um, cantilevers, so they're down in the kind of mega for one megahertz-ish range. Um, th these groups, by the way, just to be specific, is on the GIH's group at UCSB and uh, Patrick Malatinsky's group um, in Basel. And then what I'll try to do at the end is uh, tell you about some prospects for reaching strong coupling and just a few perspectives on what might be um, the obstacles there. Um, and, and I'll try to then just wrap up. So, so here is the just reminder about what it is that we do. And so you were asleep before, so I'm just going to remind you. Um, so, in, in this uh, Hamiltonian, um, for this ground state spin of an MV center, you have some terms that, that come into the Hamiltonian that depend on stress in the crystal. Okay? So, so, these are the ones that we're working with, which are the transverse ones. Um, and then what they do is they couple <coughs> the plus one spin state to the minus one spin state. That's where they sit. Um, and so, so, my idea from the beginning is I like to do experiments that are really simple. Um, that have very simple signatures, that it, it's really easy to know when you've seen something. Um, and so, and, and, and plus I have a background in magnetic resonance. Like all of the experiments that I've ever done, with the exception of maybe one or two, involve magnetic resonance in some way. So it's a natural thing for me to say, oh, let's try to use these terms to, let's just match up the frequencies. Let's make the, the, the mechanical resonance match the spin splitting. And then what we can do is just drive mechanical resonance of spins. So we use a mechanical oscillator and we drive the spins. And so what that's going to do is the, this perpendicular term is just going to squish the sort of C3V symmetry of an MV center. And that's going to create these plus and minus two spin transitions. But it's just within some sp subspace of the spin. It's just ordinary magnetic resonance. Um, okay, so. How are we going to do that? Um, now, one of the things that I, I want to just kind of give you is so why was it plus or minus two? So, so because what it does is where it just the simple answer is yeah. that where it is in the Hamiltonian, it just couples together plus one and minus one, so that's plus and minus two. And 
But from the basics of how a phonon and the angle momentums and yeah. energy conservation, I mean, this, this particle has no angle momentum, right? Ah, uh, is that necessarily true? Okay. So, yeah. so let's just let me give you a simple analogy that you can think about. Um, <clears throat> so let's say that I'm doing EPR, conventional EPR, you know, Edwin Hahn, okay? And, and I do that by taking my spins and I put it in an EPR cavity. And it's actually a, you know, somewhat low Q resonant cavity and then I can do pulse EPR, right? And so what, I mean, so there, there the canonical thing that I think about is I think about how uh, there is, I put in an oscillating field, okay? But that oscillating field actually can be decomposed into components that have angular momentum, right? Left and right circular. Okay. So there, there, is a, there is a similar thing going on in this situation. So that, so, I mean, in fact, phonons can carry angular momentum. And so, in fact, that is the correct interpretation of this. Um, and, and, and if you go, if you dive, if you go get, there's these, like, uh, ideas of, of phonons and crystals have been, you know, completely worked out in some sense. It's like a closed book. And, and indeed, they can be, they can carry lots of angular momentum in an essentially arbitrary quanta. So that, that's exactly what we couple to in these experiments. And in a sense, that's why they're hard, because that isn't the, you know, the simple thing. So we're trying to select maybe, you know, there's a sort of, maybe that's a deep reason why these terms aren't huge. I, I, I think that the arguments that I gave in the previous lectures, why they're not huge, are probably the best, easiest ways to understand it. But that's an interesting point of view. Um, OK, so, so, so what do these cavities look like? Um, so first of all, I'm going to say that uh, so there's lots of nice, beautiful quantum stuff that's presented at this uh, school, and and these these mechanical resonant resonators are not quantum. They're uh, they're they're big. So uh, what what they are is we we go and get a diamond, we buy it from element six. Um, the diamonds that I'm going to show you that in in this talk are actually not very good diamonds. They're they're what we call optical grade diamonds. They have lots of NV centers in them. So um, in principle, we could do this with a, with a single NV, and, and we found it a lot less expensive to do it with lots of NVs. Um, that, that's because there's about a factor of 10 in the price between these diamonds and the, and, the, and the ones that most of the experiments with NV centers have used. And that is just a question of, like, we're trying to cycle and do device development. So, so that, that gets expensive really fast. Um, but essentially, what we do is we get a diamond from element 6. And um, speed of sound in uh, a diamond is, is really fast because uh, diamond is very stiff. It's a very nice acoustic material, actually. So it has very low loss, and I'll give you some perspectives on that later. Um, but so, so what that means is that when you just have the crystal in your hand, you already have a mechanical resonator because uh, these, these are more or less parallel mirrors for sound. So the, the really the only challenge then is there's two parts that we have to add to the system. The first one is that we have to excite those uh, resonant mo modes of that already cavity that we have in our hand. Um, the other thing is that we have to be able to have a way of kind of putting our spins into the correct subspace to observe these kinds of interactions. So that's why we have two parts to our fabrication. So the first thing that we do is we fabricate a device that electrical engineers or mechanical engineers call an H-bar. So as a, as a kind of quantum physicist, this is a very amusing uh, acronym. It's not like some fancy thing that I came up with. It stands for High Overtone Bulk Acoustic Resonator. So that's, that's exactly what the device is. Um, but it, you know, as, as if you're an AMO person, which it seems like most people here are, uh, you, you can think of it as a fabric pearl cavity, but for sound waves, not light waves. Um, to excite it, we fabricate this transducer. Um, it's just simply nothing more than a piezoelectric material that we deposit um, on, onto the diamond in the sandwich between two metal electrodes. Um, in the beginning, we were using aluminum nitride. Um, we were having that grown in the front, and later we ended up switching to a different material. I'll explain why later. Um, and then on the underside, the opposite side of the diamond, we just, in, in very simple little structure, this is a wire. So what this is, is these are bonding pads. We drive microwave current through here. You get a microwave magnetic field. That's our conventional uh, you know, spin control for that. OK, so um, the first kind of device that we fabricated that actually worked, uh, this is the data. 
So this is data that just this is just a network analyzer. And this is you know room temperature. Everything I'm going to show you is room temperature. Um, but this looks like a Fabry Pro resonator. So you you sort of something that you're familiar with and you recognize. So there's a comb of uh, modes, and they're just simply every time another acoustic wavelength lines up along the thickness, you get another mode. Um, and so, and they're and they're relatively high frequency modes. Now, in terms of the like quality factors that you just heard about um, from McCoon, these are ridiculously low. So this is this is um, the, the experiments that we first performed were on this particular mode at just over one gigahertz. Um, its quality factor was 430. Okay, it wasn't even all that well impedance matched the circuit. So that that was something that we actually had to work out later. But because diamond is so nice. That actually, we can put a lot of microwave power in there, so we can have a lot of uh, stress actually generated in the standing wave. And so just to give you a sense of scale, uh, we drive it with 25 dBm of microwave power into the input port of this transducer, and we get about 10 megapascals of stress along 001 of the crystal. Did you have a question? I was just wondering what S11 was, but I think it's probably the screen. Oh, no, 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 S11 is a network analyzer. It's a, it's a, it's the, it, what you do is you put in a power and then you measure the reflected power back. And, and this is the ratio of those. Okay, um, so, so that's, that's what we have. And then just kind of doing some calculations, taking that, that AC stress that we get, um, this number comes out of modeling that we compare to the network analyzer measurements. Um, and then and sort of the non-axial stress of the AC center, we expect around seven megapascals. And so just based on the numbers that at the time we expected, which were relatively close to what actually is, um, is something like 200 kilohertz of a driving field that you could expect. Um, so okay, so let's see what we can do. So we want to do an experiment with that. By the way, 200 kilohertz um, is not going to be strong enough to see coherent stuff in the sample. And that's again because these diamonds that we've got, these cheap diamonds, they're, they're, the spin coherence is bad. Um, so this is going to be a thing that we're, we're fixing now, but that, that's, a, that's an effect that you should be aware of. Okay, so, um, so we want to try to observe now just the simplest thing, which is just let's see if we can create spin transitions driven by mechanical oscillations. And the thing that I want to be clear about is that, uh, you know, this is kind of really a direct spin phonon interaction. There's no magnetic field that's mediating this interaction. It's really just the thing wiggles, spins move. That's, that's exactly what happens. But in order to actually see that, we have to do a little bit of work. Um, so we're going to have to work into the subspace of minus one and plus one. That's the states connected by this uh, spin phonon interaction. But when we shine in light, we polarize the spins into the zero level. Okay. Um, so because we're going to do spectroscopy, we're going to want to scan around to see these lines. And so one of the challenges that we have is how do we very reliably transfer the population of the spin into the minus one level, or either one, it doesn't really matter, um, from zero in, in a way that's really insensitive to the magnetic field, because we're going to want to want to you know, vary that. And so if we just use a magnetic pi pulse, that, that is going to become problematic. Um, so the solution is something that um, is going to be very familiar to people that do sort of EPR or magnetic resonance, which is you use a thing called an adiabatic passage, which is you apply, you sweep the frequency across this transition, and adiabatically you transfer the population. And you can do it so that as you adjust the magnetic field, you're going to go through the frequency at a, at a different point, but you're always going to go through it. And so essentially this sort of adiabatic transition, what, as soon as you hit the, whatever that resonance frequency is, as soon as you hit it, you adiabatically transfer the population into the other spin level. And so this is a very nice tool to use for spectroscopy when you expect that you're going to be adjusting the magnetic field. OK, so we do that. And then we turn on the MEMS. So we just put that you know, 25 dBm or whatever into the, into the transducer. And we turn it on for some uh, duration. And what we hope to see is that if there is a resonance between the spin splitting between the, the, the minus one and the plus one spin levels, then we should see some population starting to move between these two. And then in order to see that population, we're going to just repeat our adiabatic passage. And so whatever population was in minus one is going to get moved down into zero. And then as we scan around 
and read out, because uh, as you now know from, from the first lecture, when you measure uh, fluorescence readout at MV center, what you're essentially doing is measuring the zero level. So we measure the zero level, and whatever is, is, not, is missing is, is, is up here in plus one. So that's what we're looking for. Okay. Um, and so then, then we do spectroscopy, and we're looking for how, you know, we know the magnetic, uh, the mechanical resonant frequency, let's tune it into the spin resonance. And this is what we get. Um, so, so what you can see are the three hyperfine states of the MV center. So I, I didn't talk about it, but Paula did. So um, MV centers, um, typical native MVs, that is ones that naturally occur in the diamond, are going to have a nitrogen 14 nuclear spin that they're coupled to. And so nuclear spins of nitrogen 14s are spin 1, so there's going to be three different transition energies that you can get. And it's just exactly the textbook value. <laughs> So this is good. We're very happy. Um, we can use the, the amplitude of these spectral features to compute the driving field that we get, and we get it to be around uh, 230 kilohertz, so that, that's in quite good agreement with our expectation. So in other words, we model our device accurately. We know um, what's going to happen. So this is kind of, okay, we're going to like declare success. We've, we've done something good. Um, I think that as we all know, if you try to do something that's a little bit new, you have to be very, very careful. Um, so if, if I were cynical, and, and I am, um, then what I would sort of, if I were reviewing our paper, I would say, well, you know, okay, um, you're putting 25 dBm of microwave power into this transducer, there's electric fields, there's magnetic fields that are right there. Um, couldn't they cause transitions too? And the answer is, in, under certain conditions, yes, they actually they could cause transitions. And so we want to know, is this really mechanical? That's the kind of question that we have. Um, so how are we going to figure that out? How are we going to really show that this is truly mechanical and not just some stray signal? Because this is not a huge signal, OK? This is not big. Um, so, so what are we going to do? <laughs> Ah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the answer is, so what, this, this is a calibrated scale, okay? It's calibrated to the full electronic transition. So if we did exactly a pi rotation for each of the nuclear spin cell levels, it should go up to point, uh, so sorry, a full pi rotation should go up to 0.33, okay? And then if you just kind of work through, we're in the linear response regime of magnetic resonance and compared to the phasing time and all of that. This is exactly what you expect. It's a small signal. So you need to, it's, it's not a strong drive relative to T2 star. So how big is T1 and T2 and all that, all that stuff? So T1 is, is long. It's like um, uh, something like a um, millisecond or something on that order. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and the T2 star, which is the kind of right thing to compare to this, is probably half a microsecond. I have data on this later on in another device, so you can actually see it directly. So it's, it's, it's quite short, and then uh, and so then what happens is it saturates. And there's data on that, 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 you know, if we try to put in, like, increase the pulse length on these samples, it just kind of, the, the population comes up and then it saturates. It just defaces at this level. And that... That's right. The spin line width is limiting. That's exactly what it is. And how many NVs are, are, are you measuring? So this is like 100 NVs that we're collecting over right here. Because again, it's just these kind of crummy diamonds that we get, and they have a big ensemble of NVs as received. And so on the good side, you know, it's a small signal, but it's averaging over you know, a lot of NVs. So it, it's easier to see a small signal when there's a lot of NVs there. OK. Um, Okay, so how are we going to see this real signature of mechanics in this experiment? And what we can do is we can take advantage of the periodicity that's inherent in this type of a mechanical resonator. So any stray fields coming out of the transducer on this side are going to just monotonically decay as a function of position inside the sample. But the mechanics have this periodicity associated with the standing wave, and so we can look for that periodicity and see if it's there in the experiment. Now, the only kind of thing about this that's hard is that diamond has got a very large uh, index of refraction. It's 
And so when you focus a relatively high MA objective, this is a 0.8 MA objective, um, into this high dielectric material, you have this really large refractive aberration. So what happens is, um, you know, it does two things. The first thing is that you think you're focused here, and you're actually focused way in here. So you have to be really careful about what position you're probing. And the other thing is that, as if you work through this, I was very proud in the supporting online materials of this paper, if you look at it, we actually um, invoke Fermat's principle to derive this uh, relationship. And that's essentially what you have to do. Um, so, so what you can see is the point spread function of the microscope gets spread out because essentially sine theta is not equal to theta. So there's not a very simple geometric relationship if you integrate over all of the cone angles um, for the focused light. That's essentially what's going on. But in fact, that's just geometric optics, and you can do that, and then you can figure out where you are, and you can then park that focal position at a different place in the diamond and repeat the experiment that I just showed you and look at what you get. And so this, this is the data. Um, so just to, just to kind of tell you exactly what's going on here, these blue points, these are the experimental measurements, just the amplitude of this, this, this uh, spectral lines that we see. Um, this gray, this is the standing width. We know it exactly because the network analyzer measurements tells us we can get the speed of sound, we can get everything out of that. And then essentially the mode spacing is what that is compared to. And, and then uh, this red curve is a model that we created based on how we know how the point spread function evolves. Um, and so we know that as we go deeper and deeper and deeper, it stretches out the optical collection mode. And so essentially we start to average over a node and an anti-node, so it washes out the oscillation. But what you can see is the oscillation is clearly there in the experiment. So, so after seeing this, and after really going through this very carefully, now I, now I really believe it. So now, now we know that this is in fact a mechanical drive for these spins inside the crystal. Okay. So, so we were very happy, and um, we published this in you know, very, very late 2013. Um, okay, so then after that, it was a question of doing some engineering. Um, so now I haven't pointed that out yet, and I'll do acknowledge this later, but one of my collaborators on this project is Sunil Bave, who is a high-frequency MEMS expert. And so this was really uh, a very fruitful collaboration, and um, you know, it really uh, it was important to have that kind of expert knowledge to kind of work out some of these engineering issues. Um, essentially, I would have probably not been able, it would have taken me a lot longer to work these things out. What, what temperature were these measurements taking? Room temperature. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so what is the goal, first of all? Um, we want to just, at this stage, see coherent interactions. We did spectroscopy, okay, we know the basic interaction is there. Can, can we do coherent interactions? And so, you know, we're working with T2 star. Um, that, that is the inhomogeneous leaps in a homogeneously broadened spin line width. Um, Paula actually talked about the origin of T2 star a little bit. Kind of comes from fluctuating local configurations of spins in the spin bath. Um, when you do a Ramsey type experiment, you'll see that. Um, and, and that's sort of similar. It's, in, in Ravi, it's a little bit, um, a little bit longer actually, because you get a little bit of, uh, in a Ravi experiment, you get a little bit of what's called continuous dynamical decoupling the sort of Rabi gap actually protects the spin a little bit. So that, that gets a little bit longer in a Rabi experiment, but that protection depends on the strength of the Rabi field itself. Um, so what we really want to do is we want to drive it as hard as we can. That's, that's what we want. Um, so how are we going to do that in, in compared to our previous things? Well, it turns out that it's just a lot of nitty gritty details, and that's always true. So um, just kind of where do the nuts and bolts live? Well, the first thing was, as I mentioned, to create these resonators to drive them, we were depositing aluminum nitride, which we did not have the capability at Cornell to do. And so we were sending it off to a foundry, and, you know, and then they would deposit it, and the aluminum nitride they deposited it was high quality, but it would take like three weeks to get a sample over and back. And so that was really limiting our development cycle time. Um, so that was one problem. Um, we were terrible impedance match. The impedance match was, we were not 50 ohms. And so that meant that a lot of our power just reflected back, didn't get into the device. Um, we started out with pretty, pretty current quality factors, so we needed to do that better. Um, the power handling was bad. Uh, the diamond could have taken a lot more than 25 dBm of power. 
Um, it turns out the aluminum electrodes on the top were burning. That was what, when we go above 25, that's what happened. Um, so that was an issue. And there was a lot of coupling to spurious kinds of mechanical resonances that we were not interested in. Um, so we wanted to try to solve all of those problems together. Um, so we did that. Uh, well, we, we, we made progress on that, I should say. Um, so here is a, 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 a microscope image of one of the new generation devices um, that solves several of these problems. The first thing is that our, our piezoelectric material now is zinc oxide, which we can actually deposit on site with sputtering. It has exactly the same efficiency, more or less, as the you know, foundry deposit of aluminum nitride, but we can do it in an afternoon, so that's, that's very nice. Um, we, this is a Sunil's suggestion, we apodize the shape of these things, and that limits coupling to kind of transverse modes, so that it's really just trying to more select for the thickness mode that we're after. Um, this, then we also changed the shape and symmetry of our uh, magnetic antenna on the back side, which actually creates a different boundary condition on the back surface, um, which we believe was hurting our Q factor, although we didn't do a super careful um, test of that. Um, and, and then, of course, some of these other ones are easier. You can just make thicker electrodes, you can tune the impedance with the total area, things like that. Um, so, so let me just kind of put all of this in perspective. Um, how, how are these resonators, and in fact, I, I was very glad that uh, McCoon mentioned the, sort of the importance of this FQ product um, in, in, in understanding and characterizing um, mechanical oscillators. So this is, this is a really critical thing, and this, there's a few points that I want to make about this plot. Um, so, so our first device, which was a Q of 430, but it was at 1 gigahertz, that is this point right here. So we were right about an FQ of about 10 to the 12. Okay. Um, our, our newer sort of generation has moved over. We went to slightly lower frequencies. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there's various reasons for that. But, uh, you know, and then, and then what I also have plotted on here are the other groups that are working in diamond with mechanical resonators. Um, and what are their FQ products? And it, and it turns out that, you know, th these are some really, you know, heroic fabrication and really high quality devices. These guys have reported cues of a million. These are 500,000 or something like that at room temperature, so it's almost a million. And it's, it's just astonishing. But FQ, of course, is sensitive to both F and Q. So, you know, our device at 400 over here is actually kind of more or less the same value of FQ as everybody else. You start to wonder if that's an intrinsic thing. Now, thermal elastic damping theory kind of tells you that your limitation is somewhere over here at room temperature. So it seems to me like um, you know, our kind of diamond community has to go through the same kind of journey that Makund has taken, started to move on into with the silicon nitride. There's obviously a gap here. Okay? So we're now getting up to the point where we see something like 5 times 10 to the 12, not quite 10 to the 13 FQ products. And of course, we want to do better than that. Um, so, so, I mean, this is just kind of a contextual thing, but that's sort of the situation. And in fact, actually, if you go to the literature and you look for diamond mechanical resonators that are made out of polycrystalline diamond, they actually do better than, than single crystal diamond. And I think a, a big part of that is just simply the controllability and the engineerability of these materials. It's hard to work with three millimeter substrates. It's very hard to do that. And so, you know, that you have to develop the techniques and the expertise to get it exactly right. Um, and and so, so I think this is going to continue to be a work in progress, but I think the good news is that there's a lot of headroom. And of course, if you go to low temperature, these things go up. Now, I can tell you, and I, don't, I, don't want, I didn't show the data because uh, this was Sunil's, Tanay, Bob, uh, Tanay uh, Gasolvi took this data and I didn't choose to put it up here, but I mean, he, has mentioned, he has measured our devices um, and looked at different modes as a function of temperature, and what he sees is that you, know, you don't get a huge increase in the quality factor as you go to low temperature. And that is kind of pointing towards clamping losses or other radiation loss mechanisms. So I think there's still more engineering to do uh, for us to get these quality factors up higher. Okay, now that we have a better generation of devices, what can be done? Um, so one thing is that we wanted to try to do Rabi oscillations, and, and as you can see, we can do that. Um, this is a measurement duty cycle that looks very similar to the one that I showed you for spectroscopy. It's essentially the same experiment. We just fix 
onto the resonance, and we change the duration of the mechanical pulse, and we see, you know, oscillations like this. And so it, it, it's it's okay. You know, it's a coherent oscillation, um, but it's not it's not with with the mechanical driving frequency is essentially what's going on. The other thing to be aware of is that. These are still ensemble type samples. This is like 100 NVs or something emitting, and they're collected over a pretty broad range region. This is the you know the, the, the point spread function of our microscope, and so it's some the, the signal is some funny integration over this envelope, and so part of this dephasing is actually due to real spin dephasing, and part of this dephasing is actually due to uh, collecting because. The NVs that sit right on the anti-node are driven harder than the, than the ones that are over here at the wings of our collection, and of course they don't see as big of a field. So that's, that's essentially describes this data very well. Now what you notice is that this is quality factor of 1300, uh, but the frequency of the mode is 1.1 gigahertz, which puts this wavelength here at about 15 microns. So this is like 7 microns, and that's comparable to the collection inside the diamond. But we can also build devices um, that are lower frequency, <laughs> which stretches out this wavelength and allows the point spread function to fit really more compactly inside. And so then we can improve the homogeneity of our driving on the ensemble. Okay, um, so we try to do that, and actually something funny happened. Um, and of course, in hindsight, everything is obvious, but we were just continuing on our way. This device has um, a, a mechanical resonance of 530 MHz, um, so that's almost a 30 micron uh, wavelength for the stress wave, and a quality factor of 4000. And so we were like, okay, this should work really well. We should, you know, we expect some several megahertz of driving field on this. Um, and actually, that I mean, what you get is this kind of thing. And so, so what is going on here? Um, and actually, so those of you that were here for Paula's lecture already know what the answer is, which is, uh, this is a resonator. This is not a wire. So a Rabi experiment is normally done in EPR with a very low Q resonator. And now already we've greatly exceeded what people use for pulse EPR. We're already well above it. People use something in the hundreds of Q. And now we're in the, in the thousands. And so that already leads you to doing the wrong experiment, because the experiment that we're doing here is we're gradually increasing the pulse duration to the mechanical resonator, but of course, as you change the shape of your pulse, the pulse has this spectral profile, and the spectral width of this profile depends on the duration of the pulse. These are just the transforms of each other. And so as we apply the sharp pulses, we, we're actually not coupling. The line width of the, of the resonator is too good now, all of a sudden. So we have to change our experiment and actually start to really think about this system not as just a, a wire. It's really, it's really actually a resonator. Um, so, so this is what we did. Um, and it's actually a, a, nice, uh, a nice way of doing it. And, and what we're doing here is we're taking advantage of the fact that this is not a, you know, the sort of inconvenience of polarizing into the zero level is actually now a feature because what it means is we can use magnetic pulses which can be very fast. So we can do a pi pulse um, to go say from the zero to the minus one state in only about 30 nanoseconds in these structures. So these are essentially negligibly short compared to the kind of mechanical Rabi frequency that we get in these devices. So what we can do is we can just use a pair of magnetic pi pulses to control the interaction time between the spin and the mechanical resonator. And then what we do is we just fix two pi pulses and we just sweep them through this region where we have a single unchanged pulse on the mechanical resonator. So then the mechanical resonator will, this is a relatively long pulse, if, if memory serves right, it's three uh, microseconds. So it'll, it'll ring up and then it'll be on and then it'll ring down. And we're just going to see that dynamics. And when we do that kind of measurement, this is kind of the raw data, okay? Um, so this is actually plotted as a function of this delay up here. And you can see as, as these start to enter the, the mechanical pulse, you get these coherent oscillations. 
Um, they damp down, and then, uh, and then there's sort of all these other funny things, but this can actually all be described in terms of this picture right here. So what is this? This is, if you, if you, you know, we know the quality factor of the resonator, um, so we know it rings up and rings down, and so if you kind of figure out the, the total uh, pulse area by looking at some sort of unwinding, the amount of, of pulse that is seen inside these high pulses, then you get a normalized pulse area that look, goes like this. So, but there is a region that's linear, and that's this kind of region in here, where you see these nice oscillations, and then eventually you completely go through this mechanical pulse, and so it actually sees less okay, at the end. So that's, that's essentially what's going on. Um, and we can understand these dynamics very well. So actually this red curve is not a fit to the data. It's actually just solve the Schrodinger, a few hundred Schrodinger equation a few hundred times to model the dynamics. We know what the ringing should look like. And then we, we do it a few hundred times because, um, of course, there is uh, inhomogeneous broadening in the system. So uh, T2 star actually tells us what that inhomogeneous broadening is. So we solve it with a, a, a bunch of static detunings that are drawn from a Gaussian distribution that's related to T2 star, and then that exactly matches the, well, not exactly, but it very closely matches the dynamics that we see. Okay. So that's kind of some of our newest results um, in the, in the um, driving space <coughs> mechanically. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can just kind of repeat that experiment that I showed you earlier, the spectroscopy, and you can really see the effect of uh, collecting from different places inside the mechanical oscillator. So you can now uh, collect from right on an anti-node, okay, so it's quite homogeneous in that region. Or as you go deeper, you can see the point spread function spreading out. This is a kind of Gaussian approximation, and you can see that it goes from really kind of nice oscillations to uh, almost nothing is going on here because all of the all of the all, you know the spins on the left and the spins on the right kind of cancel each other out. Nothing, nothing much going on. Um, and, and the model actually reproduces this quite well, so we, we think we know what's going on. There's some. There is one non-intuitive feature here. Um, well, it's not intuitive to me. Uh, I didn't expect it immediately, which is. If you look what happens as you go towards that node from the anti-node, the frequency of the oscillations do not way slow down. I would have expected there's some like center of mass of the driving field, and that would just give you a, a, an, an average lower Rabi field, but that's not exactly what happens. Um, there's some important details here, but um, the model actually predicts the data well. There's sort of two factors. One is that um, the, uh, as you, as you, as th this effect of T2 rho, um, as you drive a spin system, the driving field decouples it from dephasing. And so the, the spins in the, that you're collecting over are actually better over here away from the node. So these ones in the node, they, they dephase immediately. And so that, that they do not really uh, contribute to the oscillation, so that does that sort of protects the ones that are oscillating at the higher Rabi field. That's one of the things that contribute. And the other one is purely geometrical. Okay. Um, now the other thing you can do, and this is actually done with one of the lower quality factor resonators, because again, you want to treat it like just a EPR cavity, um, is you can look at the qubit that you derive from the plus one and minus one spin basis. So just reminding you you have a spin triplet and conventionally you want to look at zero and plus one or zero and minus one because this is your magnetic transitions over here. But you can of course derive a, a qubit out of plus one and minus one. And so um, if you have a way of, of, of doing you know, a pi over two or a pi pulse here then you can already do decoupling. And so we just did the very simplest um, EPR kind of uh, protocol which is just do a Ramsey experiment, okay? And that, that is this data, and so what you can see is just a dephasing. Um, and what we measure is T2 star from this relaxation of 0.45 microseconds. That's just reflective of, you know, bad diamond, okay, fine. Um, lots of impurity spins in there. Um, but what's sort of interesting is one thing to be aware of is if you, you can also derive this qubit in various different ways. So 
We can do the Ramsey on the regular magnetic transitions. Um, so that's this one is 0 minus 1, this one is plus 1, 0. Okay, and these each get about 0.91 microseconds. Well, gee, that's sort of neat. So here's 0.45, here's 0.9. What's happening? Well, these both move in response to magnetic field. This one doesn't. So if we build a qubit out of minus 1 and plus 1, then it dephases twice as fast, essentially. That's, that's the story. Um, we also did it uh, plus 1, minus 1 for the magnetic sequence. So it's possible to use the same subspace, but you have to go through 0 to form rotations in this subspace. But you can do that. Um, turns out there's some interesting perspectives. And there's been a number of people looking at this plus 1, minus 1 qubit. Um, in particular, there, for example, there's some recent work uh, the Dan Rugars group at IBM, they actually find some very interesting things that when you decouple in the plus and minus one uh, system, so if you're, for example, interested in magnetic field sensing, of course you phase twice as fast, but you also are twice as sensitive. Um, and then when you decouple in that subspace, there's been some interesting findings where you actually do very well in the plus and minus. So it turns out that this thing decouples really efficiently. And I think it's not totally understood yet. There's some, some, some puzzling aspects there. So people are continuing to look at that. Um, so where are we going now? And what are the perspectives for this particular style of device? Um, so what I would say about these bulk mode resonators is that they're really good systems for investigating quantum control. Because we can drive the heck out of them. And we can do it at relatively high frequency. And we have a lot of modes to choose from. So it's really kind of nice from that perspective. So one of the things that I'm excited about is, is doing something called delta system physics. Now, for the AMO people, you probably know what that is, so I may not need to explain it. But of course, you all know what a lambda system is or a B system. Okay? With a delta system, you close this interaction contour. You actually could put a driving field on every transition connecting all three of these. And there's, there's actually a bunch of theory papers and a few experiments um, back in the 80s and 90s, people thought about this. But there's some very interesting properties here. Um, so it does all the things that the Delta system does. You can get you know, um, transparencies and population trapping, and you can create coherent states and things like that. Um, but what's different between this and the Delta system is that because you close this loop, this, this, the states that are the kind of steady states and the absorption rates actually depend on the phase in the driving field. Now, in a, in a delta system, you can, of course, use the, um, you know, you can create states, like, for example, you could control the phase between minus 1 and 0, for example, by controlling, like, the power between these. But in a, in a delta system, you could do something similar, or control absorption rates, for example, by adjusting the phase. And so that's sort of an interesting thing. We think about this might be a nice way of creating, for example, a phase sensitive detector in a spin system, which I think is, is not something that people have done. And that might have some interesting applications in, for example, inertial sensing. So if you're driving with, an, with the released uh, proof mass, and you're driving it, and it feels an acceleration, maybe the most sensitive way that you can see that is by looking at a phase shift because you're driving on all three of these transitions. So that's something that we would like to take a look at. Um, one thing I would note is that these types of uh, bulk mode resonators are not particularly a great vehicle for trying to do strong coupling physics. Um, and the reason is kind of obvious. Uh, they're big. So if you want to think about you know, the comparison to a fabric per resonator, the coupling interaction just goes like the volume of the cavity in some sense. There's also a frequency of the component that comes in for the acoustics, but that, these are big. So, so when I sit down and calculate essentially the, the single spin, single phonon coupling strength for these cavities that we're working with, it's of order of 0.1 millards. So there, there's very little chance of ever, and we can get coherent spins, but not that coherent. So I, I think that's not something that we'll need to do what other people are doing, which is looking at much smaller systems in order to try to get into that regime. OK, um, how am I on time? Uh, about 15 minutes. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, that's great. Can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Have you thought about patterning the electrodes and the piezoelectric so that you focus the acoustic wave? We have thought about making a kind of Gaussian mode 
Yeah. Yeah, we right. have Instead of just a planar resonator, you would launch the acoustic waves with the right phase so they converge. Like a, fa a phased array type idea. Yeah, yeah we have. Um, yes. We haven't done it. It, 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 it is, it is um, definitely something to think about doing. The, the more, for, from my point of view, so I have one student on this project. Mm -hmm. One. Yeah. And so that kind of is the answer to your question. Yeah. The other thing I was wondering, which is just that I wanted to put out before we go on, was that in the acoustic resonance uh, between these two plates, the phase of the motion is flipping sine. Mm -hmm. And so, is can you use that fact to tease out that you you're driving it acoustically? Whereas if you had electromagnetic fields, they would be uniform in phase. Yeah, that's true. That's a, I did think about that. Um, so I was thinking that along the sigma, along the z direction of the population of the that it wouldn't matter whether or not you go one way around the block zero. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So that's the zero alert. So I have to think about why would. That's right. So, right. so so that's an interesting idea to think about. Um, so you okay. actually just described the whole thing. Okay. Yes, I came to the same conclusion, but I already felt like just looking at the periodicity What's already right? answers the question as to whether or not it's Okay. Um, okay, so I want to talk about the other people doing work in this field. By this field, I mean very narrowly defined. People that are trying to use intrinsic strain, or sorry, controlling strain within the substrate of diamond and using that to control spins and doing interesting things, interacting with mechanical resonators and spins together. And so I'm going to focus on these two papers. Um, and so what you can see is that, uh, so, so first of all, I want to, uh, want to point out one nice fact, which is Everybody who is working on this kind of stuff is young. So I like that. That makes me happy. So there's me, there's uh, Anya Jayic's group, UCSB, there's Patrick. Now we're all kind of the same sort of generation, more or less. So this makes me, uh, like, big, big groups have not yet crushed us. So I feel good about that. Um, so, okay. So these are two really outstanding papers, and they came out at about the same time. Um, so they really kind of belong in a discussion together. Um, so they both went towards using kind of megahertz scale um, cantilevers that are fabricated out of single crystal diamond, um, and, then, and then studying those cantilevers and using that to quantitatively measure out these strain interactions. Um, our work is not quite as quantitative in terms of teasing out the coupling strength. So I really kind of rely on these guys to have quantified these couplings. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Malatinsky's work which did something, if you remember from my last lecture, um, I showed this plot from 1975, Davies and Hammers, and it was exactly this experiment for the orbital uh, strain effect. This is just the spin version of it. So instead of having a huge ball crystal and crushing it with a huge anvil cell, they uh, essentially made this cantilever and they just took a probe and just pushed on one end of the cantilever and then at the anchor, if you just find an V here near, you know, near the end on the anchor, that's going to see a lot of curvature for the bending, and so there's going to be a lot of stress. And so you can model that, you know, you do console like everybody else, and you can back out um, what the stresses are. Um, so they get these values. Um, I, th this is in a different units that I've been presenting. Um, it's just in per strain units. So this is the frequency shift per strain. But keep in mind the strains are very tiny. It's diamond, so. Think scale 10 to the 5, minus 5 type of thing. Okay, um, so these are the values that they get. I mean, it's a more or less straightforward uh, way. You know, you can back in one of these terms, the, the parallel term is just giving you a linear shift of the resonance, and the perpendicular is giving you, is splitting apart uh, the, the spin levels from each other, just exactly as I described earlier. Um, so that's, that's what they get. Um, in the Jaish group, they um, take, a, take an approach that's more dynamic. So what they do here is they um, use some of the ideas that were developed earlier at Harvard where you use a Han Echo or some other decoupling sequence synchronously with um, <clears throat> the motion of your cantilever. And so what you see is the, as, you, as you look at a Han Echo and compare it to the motion of the cantilever, <coughs> you see the periodicity of the cantilever in your in your decoupling sequence, and by modeling that carefully, um, you can pull out the values of the strain. In particular, they use the same asymmetry. If you look at how the strain is affecting 
um, the Larmor frequency of the spin, <coughs> the parallel term is, 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 is creating this linear shift, whereas the perpendicular is, is creating a quadratic shift. Okay, so it's going to change the way it's modulating uh, the Larmor frequency, and so you can use that as a way of separating out. Now, there actually is a disparity. They find a different number. Um, so this one is three times different than the one over here. Okay, so that's five, and that's 13. Um, it's, it's not immediately apparent, although I frankly think this one, uh, they argue in their paper that this one is, you know, this is done in the sort of small angle linear response regime, where this one, they really pushed it pretty hard. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if there's uh, additional measurements. Maybe uh, there's going to be some new things. We'll hear about the March meeting or something. Um, but okay, they get this value uh, for the parallel term. And then to get the transverse term, there's two clever ideas. One is just choose a species of MV that almost doesn't see any parallel stress from the motion of the cantilever. And then, of course, um, realize there's going to be some residual and model it all very carefully. Um, and so they do that, and they get the perpendicular stress out of uh, this value, which agrees extremely well with our measurements. Um, so I really I'll believe it. And it also gives good agreement with uh, the Malatinsky's lab um, and, and their work as well. OK, so that's kind of the state of things. And there's one other thing that showed up in, um, in the Malatinsky paper, which is this interesting effect. Um, so it turns out that there's a very almost one-to-one -one correlation between this system using uh, the parallel coupling, stress coupling term, um, when, you know, this kind of, this is a like seven megahertz cantilever. Um, there's an almost one-to-one -one correlation with a trapped ion. So if you look at the NV center spin and then, you know, compare it to the like motion inside the ion trap, it, it works out one-to-one. -one. So you can go find a review paper that I think all the ion trapping people know very well, and these kinds of dynamics are described exactly in that paper. But they see it in this system um, with NV centers, and essentially the phenomenology is this. So you do a, a, an ESR sweep over the spin resonance, and you see these are the three hyperfine terms, okay? And then you turn on the mechanical resonator, and then you start to see side bands appear. And this is, um, exactly explained by the same kinds of sidebands that you get in these ion trap papers. So I'm not going to belabor the point, but it's sort of, it's, it's a nice thing. They note there in the resolved sideband regime. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, I sort of, so if I want to make a point of it, I could say that our work is like we're in the resolved sideband regime by like a factor of 40 or 50 or something, but okay, I'm not going to do that. Um, okay, so anyway, th this is the, this is the thing. So this is a very neat thing, and you can imagine using these physics where you drive on one of these side residences and realize cooling or you know some one of these types of experiments that people have discussed in, in great detail at this at this school. Okay, um, so let's let's try to finish up by talking about prospects for strong coupling in the system. Um, so what are you going to actually have to do if you want to realize strong coupling? Well, the first thing is you need to work with great diamonds. So you need, you will certainly need T2 to be greater than one millisecond, which means isotopically pure diamond. Um, I think that is doable. There are a number of groups that can either grow or get isotopically purified diamonds, so that's, that's okay. Um, the quality factors are approaching the value that they have to be in low frequency, but they have to, as I'll, as I'll show you, they have to be that in higher frequency too. So if you just kind of go through the simple analysis, what you find is that for like, for example, a doubly clamped beam type nanomechanical oscillator, um, the, the intrinsic spin phonon coupling is gonna be related to simply just the frequency of the fundamental. And so you need it to be high. Certainly at least a gigahertz, probably more like five is my expectation. Um, of course, the, the oscillator has to be small to make the mode volume very small, and the bath temperature is going to need to be small. Um, I'm guessing someone's just going to go right to a dilution refrigerator and call it a day, um, and I suspect that will work. Um, because again, you just want this thermal occupation factor to be low to, to get the cooperativity above one. And you could do that at 100 millikelvin and five, or 7 millikelvin, I guess, if you might put some optical power in and warm it up. So that'll be interesting to think about in trying. Um, so what are the challenges to achieving that? Well, yeah, you have to enhance the coupling. So nobody's got a really strong single spin, single phonon coupling. The cantilevers have the highest right now. Uh, 
you have to maintain the T2 even though you do the fabrication. And there's challenges with that. You know, fabrication ruins services and, 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 and services are generally bad. Although people have made progress on that and I think that's, that's uh, a surmountable barrier. Um, you know, you want to find ways to incorporate decoupling to really get the T2 and not T2 star. That's really important. So if I just leave my spin alone, I don't get two milliseconds, you know, inverse two millisecond alignments. I have to decouple to get that. So right now, people are going to need to come up with clever protocols where they can integrate decoupling with uh, these strong coupling measurements. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, I think that collection will become an issue. So you'll want to also engineer in photonic cavities. But people have done that already. So I think that's coming. And then you're going to have to worry about these kinds of um, resonator losses that we already heard about um, from McCoon in the last talk. So I think people are going to have to actually solve these problems for single crystal diamond nanomechanical resonators. And then I think that, um, oops, sorry. And then, and then I think that there's a chance. I mean, I think this is something that will happen. It's just a question of time and, and, and graduate students sweating and going to the clean room and dip, boiling things in acid and all, all of these things. Okay. Um, all right. So, so one of the experimental progresses towards those ideas, there's a, a number of groups working on this, um, getting into this regime. So here's, for example, a nice paper recently um, out of Marco Lankar's group at Harvard. Um, where again they pattern these uh, doubly clamped beam mechanical resonators that are also photonic cavities. Um, so they, they can imagine putting an MV center right in the middle and having this really nice you know, mode coupling between different degrees of freedom. And this is very similar work out of Evelyn Hu's group and a collaboration between Ajlan Hu and um, Jayesh. So this is all, I think, very promising for this field. Um, a few other comments I want to make to help you get to strong coupling. Of course, you could do it, you could try to do it with one spin. You could also try to do it with an ensemble of spins. One of the nice things about the ground state spin of MV centers is that they're not atoms, but they're pretty close. If you apply a large magnetic field and you really are working with Zeeman states, then the gyromagnetic ratio of an electron is pretty much the gyromagnetic ratio of an electron. So, they're, they're pretty darn indistinguishable. And so you could very definitely use uh, an ensemble of NVs and do coupling and get this kind of effect. Um, one thing that you want to be aware of, though, is that if you have an nanomechanical resonator, so we imagine the sort of uh, modes of a doubly clamped beam, and not all of these are going to be equal. So if we plot the strain along this thing, so there's actually a zero crossing somewhere, right? And so if we just distribute our NVs in here, they're not all going to be equal coupling, but it still helps. So if we want to calculate the G for the ensemble, we essentially take the square root of the sum of the individual couplings. Okay? So if we assume that on average they're coupled half as well as an optimally coupled spin, then you get essentially a factor of 5. With the cooperativity, that's squared. So you get a factor of 25. So that's nice. So 100 NVs, you know, you get, you get 25 in, in the cooperativity. Um, Unfortunately, you can only do one out of four unless you have some way of directing all the NVs to point in the same direction. Because if you apply a magnetic field, then uh, only one of the sort of different possible orientations are going to align to create the Zeeman states that you're trying to come to. Um, so that's that's trade-off. And actually, people have figured out a way to have directed growth of NV centers and CVD, so maybe that's what you want to do. Um, so there's certainly things to think about. There are trade-offs. If you increase the density of NVs too high, you can't just crank it up. Um, you, they start to see each other at some point, at some density. People have estimated it to be around 10 to the 15 per cubic centimeter. And so that, that means that it's going to be a countable number. If you have a nanomechanical oscillator, it's going to be something on the scale of 100. I mean, if you're talking about a micron and, and nanometers or something on that scale, it's not going to be a huge, huge ensemble. But it can help you. Okay, um, so just kind of uh, finally I'd like to summarize. You know, I, mean, I think one, one thing that you might think about after comparing the last two lectures is what is the best way to go if you're interested in strong coupling of uh, NV spins and strain? Is it, or sorry, NV spins and mechanical resonators? Is it spin strain or is it, or is it field gradients? Which, which one is best? 
Um, so there, I think there's some advantages to each one, frankly. Um, spin strain is sort of in, intrinsic, so it's a more uniform, more scalable coupling, in my opinion. It should work very well for ensembles. Um, if you do a field gradient, you're going to have mag noise, unless you're at extremely low temperature. Um, so that's just Brownian motion of the magnetization, plus whatever FMR modes are off resonantly excited as you try to address uh, the MV spins. So that's something you have to worry about for kind of putting in uh, magnetic field gradients with a permanent magnet. Uh, similar, although there might be a, strong, a little bit of an advantage for the gradients. Um, one of the advantages of gradients, though, is that they're actually an engineerable parameter. I'm not sure that anyone has really, that IBM, they really worked hard to get a high gradient for their um, MRFM experiments. But I think that even, you know, talking to Rugar and you know, I'm kind of also in the field of magnetism, I would argue that you could still do better than that if you tried really hard. It just depends on how much effort you're willing to put in. Um, I, think that, I think this one is more straightforward to design also. So that, that has some nice advantages. And I think also this comment about mag noise is going to go away if you go to very low temperatures. It's just the magnetic state will just be pretty much locked and that'll be it. Um, so my overall feeling is that this has been a really exciting thing to do and a lot of progress has been made and there'll be a lot more hard work in difficult engineering, but I actually expect to see that happen within the next few years. So thank you very much. Um, these are the folks that have contributed to my uh, the work in my lab, and of course, special thanks to Sunil Bhave, who's an outstanding collaborator, really fun guy to work with. Um, almost all of the experimental work in my group is done by Evan McQuarrie, um, so that's essentially all due to him. Um, and Tanay Gasovi is Sunil's student. He, these two have really been a kind of dream team together to work on this, so I'm really happy to have that. Resource. And thank you all for paying attention. Thanks, Greg. Uh, it's his last day here, so it's your last few hours to yeah. bug him and pick yeah. his brain. And, uh, I'll be around. Uh, but if you have any urgent question right now, then now is the time. Yes, I knew you would. Well, well, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, well I, first of all, I, I'm, I'm really very sad that I didn't have the chance to see the first two lectures because uh, the third one is really fantastic. And maybe you mentioned it in the previous two. So, um, what is the biggest bottleneck right now um, in the fabrication of really high quality diamond structures? Yeah. Um, you so, there are people that are better than me at answering that because we've kind of made an end run along a number of the biggest bottlenecks by going to bulk structures. Right. So bulk structures, that's really great. But for the nanomechanical stuff, cantilevers and other things, you're working, you know, so your strongest coupling is right at the surface. So similar to the kinds of ideas that people are coping with in magnetometry, you want to kind of be near the surface because that's where the strain is the biggest, but of course the surface is where you're most exposed to fluctuations of the spin. That's where the spins perform the worst. Mm. I'd say that there's also just a learning curve in terms of working with diamonds. So diamond, you know, if we were working with three fives, we'd be like, awesome, mm -hmm. okay? Because you could grow sacrificial layers and all this fabrication is straightforward. But the, the like nanomechanical fabrication of diamond is very hard. And people have taken different approaches. And I think it still is working out what approaches there are. So I didn't really talk about the fabrication, but there's essentially two ways that people have done this. One is they've done what people call DOI based fabric, which is diamond on insulator. So you just you just make a thin membrane of diamond, which is hard. You have to find a way of bonding it to your oxide or whatever. Um, there's various approaches for that that people have done. And you have to thin it down because you just can't buy 100 nanometers, right? And then and then you from there do what other types of systems do, which is pattern and undercut. Um, so that's that's one issue. And then and that, that's one approach. And the other approach is this idea that they've had at Harvard um, in Mar Marco Lankar's group, which is do this angle etching. Um, and I think that's an interesting approach. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the mechanical quality of those mm -hmm. two approaches actually do. Um, with the angle etching, you have this weird shape, right? You have this triangle. And I don't know what that's going to do. I don't think anybody knows. 
Um, and then the, the DOI, you have a lot of, yeah. So I don't know, it's, it's okay. just too early. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I don't know the answer. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, any other material systems besides diamond look good? Because there's defects in many crystals. Yeah, yeah, so, so in the last lectures I also talked about Diamond has all these fabrication issues. That it sounds great, but then you can't. It's like trying to make a, a resonator out of sapphire. That, that's right, that's right. So silicon carbide looks pretty good too. Um, and of course they're working on that in the Ashalon group, and I'm sure there's a number of other people interested in that as well. Um, so in fact, one of the things that I talked about at the end of yesterday's lecture, or day before I guess, um, is that there's a polarizability in, in silicon carbide that isn't in diamond. So you get an enhanced coupling to the defects because as you apply um, a stress, it polarizes the material and it couples more strongly to the sort of ground state uh, electric dipole moment. So it's something like a factor of two uh, enhanced coupling in those systems. So that, that'll be interesting to see what happens. They're not quite as advanced as we are in diamond, but I think that we'll see very rapid <laughs> progress soon. Um, in terms of other materials... Like silicon, does silicon have a defect that's... So the problem with silicon is that um, the, it doesn't have, so I mean of course there's like phosphorus donors and bismuth and stuff, and those only really work at extremely low temperature because they're, they're hydrogenic. Yeah. Um, in terms of like tightly bound defects, I'm not aware of one that is really accessible in any way. Um, of course there's also the band gap, so if you want to do these kinds of experiments in the same way, where it's like an optical thing, then you're talking about like near infrared at least. And then the detectors out there are, I mean, we can detect single photons at room temperature easy cheesy, and that's not true. So wide band gap seems to be one of the key ingredients. And if you can think of a, I mean, on the other hand, you know, um, it, that's true in, in every step until you're there. So once you're there, you could read the spins out with a mechanical resonator, right? And so then you don't need these other things. And so, but of course, it's really helpful to have these other readout channels to, to, to step along until you get to the end point where you're really starting to couple the end point. Okay, thank you again, Greg. That was good. So remember, we have the group picture.